everyone. Um, you know, one of the things I've been researching for the last few years is advances that are happening in technology. Advances that are going to let us solve the grand challenges of humanity and really change the world. People don't understand how fast things are changing. You know, we've seen our, um, our computers get faster and faster. Right now, what we have in our pockets, our smartphones, are more powerful than the Cray supercomputers were of the 1970s. What we're carrying in our pocket are cameras, what we're carrying in our pocket are encyclopedias, all sorts of sensors. I mean, the devices that we have right now have increased so fast and have become so powerful that they can now help us solve big problems. You know, for example, um, with our mobile phones now, we can add health sensors to it and do the job that doctors do. We can, uh, we can literally have medical tests being done on our, on our phones. The phones are capturing data about us, our lifestyle, our movements, our habits. We can now have AI, artificial intelligence-based physicians, now monitoring us 24-7, or 24 hours a day, and advising us on our health. Now, with the advances that are happening in energy, for example, with solar energy, within 10 to 15 years from now, it will drop to the, to the point in price that anyone can afford energy. Within 20 years, it will be almost free. We'll, have, we'll be entering an era of almost unlimited, clean, and almost free energy. And we'll have the ability to store an energy as well so that we can basically live off sunshine. In the next four or five years, we will have self-driving cars taking us around everywhere. People don't seem to understand that these cars are so close by. I live in Silicon Valley. I see these cars driving around by themselves. The Google car, for example, doesn't even have a steering wheel. You get in it, tell it where you want to go, and it takes you there. Soon, I'm going to be uh, getting an, an upgrade to my Tesla. I'm getting a new Tesla, which will drive itself on highways. The CEO of Tesla, Elon Musk, says that by, uh, you know, within, within two to three years from now, that car will drive itself. Now, if you start thinking about what that means, imagine now when this technology comes to Mexico. Right now, the traffic here is a complete mess. You can't get from, from one point to any point, even late at night. It's crazy how bad it is here. And the problem is human beings. We human beings are uh, imperfect. We crash into each other. We rush into traffic at the same time. We break road rules. We get road rage. You know, my prediction is that within 15 years, we start debating whether human beings should be allowed on the roads at all. Within five years from now, self-driving cars will start hitting the streets of Mexico City. And you know, the lanes that you have right now for people who pay extra tolls, they can go a little bit faster. Those lanes will be converted to self-driving cars. In those lanes, we won't need speed limits because cars don't crash into each other. You won't need traffic lights because cars can talk to each other and, and give each other way. They can regulate their own speeds. Within 10 years or so, we will have electric vehicles which are powered by the sun which drive by themselves. And those vehicles will cost less than today's cars do. Within 15 years, you're talking about $10,000 electric cars that can now start taking over Mexico's highways and fixing the problems of traffic here. That's what I'm saying, within 15 years, because we'll still have a few human beings that want to go on the roads. They're the ones who will crash into the self-driving cars and to each, each other. They're going to be a hazard to us. So we will push them off the roads. The same thing happened a century ago when you had horses and you had horseless carriages, right? Eventually, the horseless carriages, which are our cars, won. That's where we're headed. And now, you also have developments happening in robots, robotics. Robots now are nimble enough to thread a needle. They can do circuit board assembly. There's a huge opportunity here for Mexico to build a manufacturing economy. What is being done in China could be done in Mexico right now, because with the robots, you can have production being done 24-7, all around the clock. Robots don't complain. They don't join labor unions. <laughs> they work very hard. But you also need to have some human beings to manage the, uh, the operation centers. Well, Mexico has some brilliant technicians. It has some brilliant scientists. It has brilliant business people. There's no reason why they can't be now setting up these robotic factories, which essentially do the manufacturing, not only for all of Mexico, but for all of America, for North America and for South America. There are massive opportunities over here. And soon we'll have robots looking after us as well. We'll have robots serving us. They'll, we'll have robots you know, taking care of our health, uh, and basically advising us. This is an amazing future we're headed into. 
Now that's the good news. The bad news is at the same time, jobs begin to disappear. Suddenly now you have robots doing all of the manufacturing. They don't need human beings to tell them what to do. You have now artificial intelligence uh, systems on your smartphones who do what doctors do to give you advice on maintaining your health. If you now want to have that extra slice of, uh, f if you have the extra piece of flan or you want to e eat more refried brains, your telephone will start buzzing and saying, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, you'll get fat. <laughs> Our phones will advise us when we're about to get sick. You see, the way that the healthcare system works right now is that doctors and hospitals only make money if we're sick. It's really a sick care system. The motivation is for us to come to them more often. Right. So what happens now when the technology industry takes over the, the um, healthcare industry, when you have Apple watches monitoring your health, information being uploaded to the cloud, you have Google now having an AI assistant advising you on your health. We, we won't fall sick very often because the technology industry wants us to be healthy, so we do more Google searches, so we use more technology. So, you know, in the process, that was the good news, by the way. And the bad news is that the job of doctors disappear. And you're going to start seeing this over and over again because almost any job that requires uh, human labor can be done by machines. And soon, in the next five or ten years, almost any job that requires human intelligence can be done by machines. So, what happens to human beings? Well, that's a big question here. Now, I had a very interesting discussion with Carlos Slim uh, when I was here a few months ago. We talked for an hour and a half on this. And Carlos actually, Carlos is brilliant. I mean, he actually, I was amazed at how much he understood. He said, Vivek, you have to realize that in Mexico, um, we, we have a lot of infrastructure to be built. This is not like America where everything is built and there's nothing to be done. We have to rebuild the entire infrastructure of this country. We have to uplift our population. And then he says also, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. What happens now when Americans are unemployed and Europeans are unemployed? Where will they come? They'll come to Mexico because we have beautiful beaches. We have Chichen Itza. <laughs> we have all of these uh, beautiful places to come. He says we, we will have uh, an economy for tourism because this is where everyone will want to come. And you know, when I thought about it, he's dead right that we now are creating opportunities for uplifting all of Mexico. Now, the key here for the population becomes learning about technology, learning, le learning about uh, apps, being able to use computers, and now um, being part of the innovation economy. The key to that is learning. So but what I keep telling people is that uh, because parents ask me what their children should study, what should we teach our children? If, they, if, if 20 or 30 years from now they're going to be uh, faced with unemployment, what should, what, should we, what should they study? What I tell them is that it's, it's even worse than that. Before, when we graduated from college, we decided what our career would be, and a career lasted a lifetime. Now a career lasts five or ten years. So even before we head to the jobless future, we will have to keep reinventing ourselves. We will have to now start adapting to new careers. So what becomes most important is the love of learning. Really, knowing where to get knowledge, knowing... Um, how to uplift yourself, and being confident that you can adapt to the new technology because there are going to be dramatic changes. Again, good news is that when you have technology doing all of these things, the cost of everything drops. See, today, it's mostly the rich that have access to advanced technologies. Tomorrow, it'll be everyone. You know, take the, just like uh, now, you know, 15 or 20 years ago, cell phones used to be f for the ultra-rich. They were for the uh, rich and powerful. Now beggars have cell phones. That's how cheap they've become. That's how they're democratized. The reason why Zuckerberg becomes Zuckerberg, you know, being worth tens of billions of dollars, is because his technology reaches billions of people. So what happens is that um, as technology advances, as you have automation, as you have all of these things happening, the cost of everything keeps dropping. So I talked about unlimited clean energy, unlimited communications, will have unlimited education as well. Already now, you can go online and start learning anything you want to learn. Pick, pick any topic you're interested in. Ten years ago, if you wanted to learn that topic, you would have to go to the library. You would have to borrow books if you had access to the library. And then you would have to 
start uh, doing courses in universities or special institutions and so on, what do you do now? You go online, you Google it, you watch videos, you download e-books, you read blogs, you read research papers. The entire knowledge of the world is available to you for free now, right? So knowledge has become practically free. And soon, when we have um, manufacturing being done by robots, the cost of manufacturing will drop. You know, I talked about self-driving electric cars. They're going to get cheaper and cheaper and cheaper to the point that we will just simply be able to have an app like you have with Uber to call your car whenever you need it, and you can go anywhere you want to go. So everything will become cheaper and cheaper. Food will become cheaper and cheaper. When you have AI-based doctors, just like when you use Google, it's for free. Your AI doctor will be for free. The sensors will be dirt cheap. So we're headed into this world in which everything becomes cheap. We have whatever we need to uplift our population, yet there's very little work for us to do. And we have to figure out what to do with our, our lives. And I'm coming back again to what I was saying five minutes ago, is it's all about education. Because my belief is that in this new world we're headed into, Life will be about the pursuit of knowledge. It'll be about the, it'll be about the arts. It'll be about music. Really, it'll be, you know, uh, I come from India. In India, we always, looked up, we always you know, looked up at the sages, at the gurus. It was all about enlightenment. We were taught, the way I was brought up, I was taught that life is about seeking enlightenment. That you want to come to the point that you've learned the key things and you've uplifted your soul. That's what my, you know, cultural values are. But that is where I think we're going to be headed up and, and ending up is in a world in which it's all about knowledge. It's all about helping others. It's all about sharing. It's all about now uplifting society. That's the future that I believe we're headed into. So let's do some questions, perhaps. So let's do some questions, perhaps. Hi, Vivek. It's a pleasure to, to know you and to know all about your ideas. What are the, the main um, trends you see in this in this industry in the financial industry the trends for the future the finance industry is one of the first to be disrupted because what does finance do it trades it trades in bits in other words it trades in digital information in the old days what banks and finance industry would do is take your money physical money take your gold store it for you right now what do you do everything is digital So as everything becomes digital, computers can start doing it. So now in finance, for example, you have Bitcoin. Bitcoin is amazing in, in the fact that it can remove all the middlemen, but it's a disaster when it comes to security, when it comes to government trust and so on. It doesn't matter. Bitcoin is just one trend. The next evolution in technology is blockchains, essentially being able to transact information digitally and electronically. So almost any type of uh, transaction which requires trust, which is what banks did, which is what Monex is based, based on, is trust, can be done through blockchain. Blockchain is an enabler of trust. Okay. So now what happens? You start looking at almost everything which the financial industry is doing. You start to see it's going to be impacted. You know, in the USA, for example, the, one of the big things that Apple announced this year was Apple Pay. It's a, a way of of, of, of use, uh, basically you know, using credit cards from your smartphone. So today they take different credit cards. The credit card industry is happy, Apple is happy. What happens when three or four years from now, Apple introduces a new option called BitPay, blockchain pay, or the Apple Bank? They wipe out the entire credit card industry. The same thing begins to happen with banking. That right now, if you, uh, you, know, you have a lot of Mexican, Mexican migrants going to America and then going to uh, other countries, When they want to send money back, they have to work through Western Union or, or uh, lots of other third parties. I don't know who all of, them, all, all of them are. They have to pay fees uh, typically between 5% and 7%. In some countries, it's as high as 12% to remit their money. So the people who are the poorest have to pay the highest fees, which is just unfair. It's, it's, you know, it's wrong. The fact that, that people who go there, they work so hard, I mean, and, and they send money back to families who are so poor. They're the ones who are ripped off the most by the financial industry. Well, guess what's going to happen when you have blockchain-based you know, digital cur currencies and transactions? They pay the same fees that anyone else does, which is 2.5 cents a transaction, not 5%. So this is the type of disruption that you're going to see in the finance industry. In economics, we have been seeing a 
new phenomenon uh, of the risk of uh, deflation, which is the, the, this uh, decrease in prices no? right. all around the world. It could be uh, because of a lack of demand, uh, structural changes due to these changes in technology, you know, it was what you were explaining. These uh, decreasing prices could be, uh, I don't know, supported in the long run. You're asking a really important but very scary question because the economic models of the past don't necessarily apply to the future. First of all, there is going to be disruption. The entire oil economies are going to be wiped out. China manufacturing is going to be wiped out. So you have countries like Venezuela now, already in bankruptcy, completely toast. Okay, you have other um, you know, oil producing countries whose economies begin to crash. On the other hand, you have kind of economies like Mexico, which benefit from it. Because you know, uh, as Carlos said, you have the entire economy here to uplift. So now you suddenly have people who are poor, who are now becoming equal to other people in, in purchasing power. And in short term, next 10, 15, 20 years, amazing things happen because you start uplifting the entire population, you start educating the entire population. When 100 million more Mexicans now come on the internet, they will have access to the same knowledge that you folks do. They will be able to transact the same type of, of uh, businesses. They'll be able to open up businesses, they'll be able to sell the goods online, they'll be able to learn about, about um, you know, things that they never even imagined before, they'll be able to learn online. So the economy grows because of that. But then the prices of everything drop, it shrinks because of that. And then we get to a jobless future in which um, people are unemployed and, and governments have to figure out how to sustain the economies. So we may be talking about minimum, uh, give, giving everyone a basic minimum income. We may be talking about other government pr programs. The fact is that I don't know the answers. Economists don't. Economists are in the past. That's the problem with economists, that the way they work is that they draw a straight line. Point one, point two, point three. It's always a linear line. Technology is not advancing linearly, it's advancing exponentially. And economists can't think exponential. They are going back to the economic theories that were developed 50 years ago, 100 years ago. And they worship the same people, right? So the, the fact is that the world is changing rapidly. So economists will have to now learn about the advances. We will have to have nationwide discussions about how do we develop new social models, how do we develop new economic models. But the good thing is that we do this in an, in, in, in a new era in which it's not about um, fighting starvation, about fighting poverty. It's in an era of abundance in which everyone has their basic needs met. Worrying about what people do with their lives is a much easier thing to do than to worry about how you feed people. You know, if you have starvation happening, if you have disease, people dying from disease, you have uh, uh, social unrest because people are uneducated and they're being left out, that's hard. Worrying about how do you distribute prosperity is relatively easy. So if you're an economist, start learning about these advances because we need smart people now guiding us into the future. <laughs> Whoever has the mic, please go ahead. Regarding all this um, situation about the, the, the speed of the changes uh, in our life, uh, I've been uh, having conversations with my daughters. They are teenagers, and uh, we are talking about the, their future careers. So um, I want to, to ask you which are the most important uh, errors they need to avoid when they choose a... Uh, no, the errors you need to avoid. Yeah. Your children know what they, uh, you know, basically they have their own desires, they have their own strengths, they have their own weaknesses. They know what they want to learn. What normally happens is that parents tell their children what they must study. That they may want to be artists or musicians, and parents say, no, you must be a doctor or, or scientist. Or they want to uh, be a doctor, parents say, no, you must be an engineer. Okay. The future we're headed into, it's really about love of learning, wanting to, you know, really believing in, in yourself, being self-confident, being rounded, be, you know, having the social skills as well as the technical skills. So let your children do what they want to do. Because if things do go the way that with, with, uh, I'm saying they will, and there's a very good likelihood that they will, that everything becomes cheaper and we begin to solve grand challenges, then for your children, it's not like it was for you. For you and I, in our era, for our parents, it was about survival. Our parents had to work in factories. They had to work extremely hard. They had to work on farms. You know, they had to really put up with, with, very, with great difficulties just to survive just to educate us, just to feed us. 
For our children, it's a different lifestyle. Your children are quite well off. They have the luxury of being able to pursue their passion. So let them do that. You know, let them do what their heart says. And if they do that, they'll love learning. And then they can reinvent themselves. In your opinion and experience, what are the key uh, skills that we should have as a person or as a company for have a competitive advantage in the future? Well, first of all, everyone needs to know technology. That if right now, if you're not using email and computers, you're toast. Basically, all you can do is some menial work. You're not fit to work in a company anymore. Another thing is that before in companies, you used to have um, experts who hoarded knowledge. They were, the, they were the people you went to in specific subjects. Experts are, are good at telling you what can't be done. They're good, telling you, they're good at telling you why you should not bring in a new technology which disrupts their knowledge. Okay? They basically are the enemies of innovation. Um, what companies have to start realizing is that what people have started realizing is, is that now in this new world, it's all about sharing knowledge. It's not about hoarding knowledge, but sharing knowledge. It's about working together. You know, just like on social media. I'm, I mean, I'm on Twitter all the time. I'm tweeting my thoughts, tweeting my ideas. And anytime I need anything, I tweet something and people come back to me. And I have an army of people who can, who can, who can help me now, right? It's all about sharing. So I share, I give to them my, my knowledge, and then they give me back their knowledge. This is how, you know, I mean, a lot of things I know, I know because um, social media, because I'm connected to, you know, hundreds of thousands of people, literally, all across the world. This is why I've gotten smarter over the last few years, not, not stupider, because I have that knowledge. Imagine doing that within companies. Imagine applying the same methods within companies now and having people learn from each other, share knowledge, and uplift the company. That's the type of thing that needs to change. What about the classic jobs like a plumber or a salesman? Because we are still humans and we still need to shake a hand when we make a deal. I tell you, I, 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 I don't, but I make deals all the time. I don't shake hands with anyone. It's all done virtually. I mean, I, um, almost everything I do, I mean, I, um, my son bought a house, um, um, you know, last year. We did everything using email. We never even met the real estate agents. Okay, this is what was in San Francisco. So that's all virtual. Now, plumber, yes, for the next few years, we still need plumbers until we have robots that can do the job of plumbers. You have a little robot at home that's, that can simply go and 3D print another part and replace it on, on, on its own. That's probably mid-2020s, no, not early 2020s, mid to late 2020s, but those jobs will disappear also. I'm going to conclude with a thought, okay? Everything I talked about almost, except for jobless future, was good. At the same, almost every good thing I talk about, there's a dark side to it. There's, you know, there's a, there are a lot of risks over here that, that we don't come together as humanity, that we start ripping each other apart. There are two paths I see. One is Mad Max dystopian future. Another one is Star Trek future. I sincerely believe we can make a Star Trek future for ourselves if we now come together as humanity and develop the economic models, develop the social uh, purpose, start now educating the people who are left out. All of you can now start uplifting other populations. I mean, if you take cheap tablets from India and China, load them up with, uh, with education apps, you can go to villages and start educating the children in those villages. Okay? All of us can now start uplifting the population. All of us can start taking this prosperity and start distributing it. There are no excuses over here. Every single one of us has a role in uplifting humanity. If we start doing that, if we start taking our obligations seriously to humanity and realizing what's possible, we will build a Star Trek future in which we start now exploring different worlds because we've done all the exploration we wanted on this planet. We're now going exploring other planets. That's the future we can all head to if we come together. Please make it happen. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.